Sorry, Mother Nature. I think I'm going to have to let you go from this lighting gig. Oh my goodness, is it cold out here. Anyway, so the channel is going to be a little bit concentrated on this table build for a while now. Today I'm going to start out by doing a lot of my layout work. Uh, first thing I'm going to complete is the legs. They're pretty simple. I've got this eight quarter ash. I'm going to cut it into four inch strips, glue two of them together to make four by four legs. After having cross cut the board to length, I then joint one edge to be my reference for ripping to width. I'll check this edge for squareness using winding sticks and a straight edge. If you don't have winding sticks, you can use another reference that you know is straight and true. A couple levels or your diamond stones. Dead on. Using that jointed edge, I mark out a line for the width of my board and then rip to width. After this, I just keep repeating until I've got my eight halves. After ripping the two halves to approximate width, I like to let them sit for a day or so before I plane them to relieve the internal stresses and let them do most of the twisting that they're going to do. Then I can plane that out. Joint remaining three sides. If you have one spot that's particularly high, just take it down real quick and frequently check with your square. And also check along your length with a straight edge. This is to ensure that you haven't dished out the middle. You also want to check for consistent thickness from time to time. I've made wedges before because I got carried away with my planing. After flattening the long edges, I turn to the shooting board to get my ends nice and straight. Just want you to know I really lucked out on the stock here. Anything wider and I wouldn't have had a plane capable of dealing with this. Before applying any glue, I want to make sure that these two pieces sit squarely against each other. Now I know that I've checked these with straight edges and whatnot, but there still could be a little bit of tear out or a knot or something that prevents them from sitting against each other just right. So I put the first one on my bench flat, make sure it doesn't rock, put the other one on it and check to make sure that it doesn't rock. One of the main things that can cause something like that is oddities in the wood such as knots. I went as far as actually drilling out these knots All right, well now it's time for the glue up. First thing I'm going to do is add some tooth to the mating pieces. I made a toothing blade for my number four, but I don't want to change out the blades for it right now because I've got it set up for smoothing. Somehow I failed to film it, but you do want to consider your grain orientation before you do the glue up. You'll see what I mean later in this video when I'm laying out my mortises.
Next I have to remove all the squeeze out from the glue up. I chose not to wipe it off with a damp cloth because of the cold temperatures. So to pull this off you can use a glue scraper or I like to use an old beater chisel sometimes. That way I don't have to worry about it too much if it gets damaged. I suppose I could even make this a dedicated tool by rounding off the corner so I don't have to worry about it scraping the wood. After I got the majority of the glue off, then I can plane the joint to make sure it matches up perfectly as there are slight inconsistencies where it lined up. Mostly because I wasn't careful enough clamping it. After cleaning up the glue, I've gone and checked for squareness again along the length of the leg using my reference one face as a reference again and three sides checked out and one side needed a little bit taken off one side it happens so now that that's done we got a few more steps left on the leg we need to break the edges we need to give a chamfer to the foot side of it and we need to cut mortises for the cross members. So to break the edges, you could use just any hand plane that you've got, or I just happen to have this chamfer plane that was given to me as a gift that'll Ensure 45, but it's not that critical. I think I might go a little more than normal. All you really got to do is just take off one or two little wispy shavings to prevent splintering. I might actually go a little more than that for the aesthetic of being able to see the edge. Having chamfered those edges will also help prevent tear out when we bevel the foot of the leg. Before we start beveling for the foot, we want to make sure we have our leg oriented in the position we like. In this case, this arch has been created by gluing the two pieces together, and I like that I get to point upwards. I think that would be most appealing aesthetically. We also have an arch on this side that points up and half arch on this side that points up. To ensure that our bevel looks nice and neat, I'm going to scribe a line all the way around the circumference of the leg. In this case I've chosen a quarter inch. I think anything from a quarter to three eighths would look decent on this. Just use your own eye. And then using the same exact measurements, I will scribe lines on the from the four edges on the base. Thus by planing from this edge to this edge being equidistant, we'll end up with a 45 degree angle. Okay, to plane this bevel on here, we want to make sure that our plane is pointing mostly in the direction of the grain. However, I will cant it out this way to about what I think is 45 degrees. And I'll cant it this way, top towards the camera there, somewhat as well. Then I begin taking a few shavings at what I believe to be 45 degrees or close to it. Being particularly careful to start off the edge here 
my own personal experience, sometimes I don't cut quite as much on the beginning. And then as I start taking thicker and as I start taking wider and wider shavings, I watch the progress of the bevel as it approaches my two lines and I adjust this angle to compensate until I'm approaching both at an equal rate and thus maintaining my 45 degree angle. One more thing is when you do get to the edge you have the risk of tear out so you may want to work about two-thirds of the way from one side and then two-thirds of the way from the other. Before cutting our mortise and tenon I need to decide which sides I want to face out as far as presentation of the grain and they need to be two adjacent sides so I believe I want this side where I've got this arch showing and this side where I've got these arches showing to be out I know I definitely want to hide this side so I'll mark it and this side looks nice but we can't have two opposite sides facing out at the corner of the table, obviously. So I will mark it as well. Now I know where I'm going to cut my mortise. I also know where the inside is and where which corner is the inside corner. That will be this corner right here. So I will mark it as well. We're going to reference everything off of this inside edge because that will give us our critical dimensions for the inside shape of <clears throat> the table. If the actual leg widths end up slightly different and I measure, but I still measure everything from this inside corner, it doesn't matter if a leg sticks out a 32nd of an inch more than another leg, it's the inside dimension that gives us our actual play area that's critical. Hope that makes sense. Okay, note self. Need to buy one of those uh, mortising marking gauges. The cross members of this table are going to be made out of five quarter inch lumber. So looking through my chisels and just sort of eyeballing it, it looks like half inch is going to be the way to go for cutting this mortise. The cross members are going to be about four inches, so I've marked that out in pencil. Again, remember we're measuring from this inside corner, and we're measuring from this top surface here. The whole top sub-member is going to sit on top of here and top of these cross pieces. I'll mark out all of our legs at the same time for consistency's sake. Probably want to come in down an inch from the top, so there's plenty of material up here to avoid busting out the end as we chisel it, and we'll come up maybe half an inch from the base here. Marking this approximately where it's going to be. Uh, the shoulder on our tenon will hide if I go over a little bit in width. So we'll mark both locations here. And we'll likewise want to mark our other legs as well. For a half inch here, it doesn't have to be exact, we just want to be consistent the whole way around. So I'm going to use my half inch chisel to mark it, to measure it. All right. 
there's top and bottom of our mortise. Now we need to lay out the width of it. This is going to be a little bit more critical measurement. I want to come in about half an inch from this edge. However, I'm not going to measure from this side. Remember, we're referencing everything off of this inner corner of the leg. And mark between our top and bottom marks. I've switched marking gauges so I can use this one over and over again for these marks. Now we should mark out the thickness of our chisel off of that line. Put my marking knife in here. Slide my chisel right up to it at both ends so I know that it's square. And we're just going to use the chisel because I know it's consistent width for this inside mark. Here I've darkened in with pencil my layout just so you can see it. So as I make this cut I want to keep a strop nearby so I can give a quick tune up to my chisel every minute or so. I also Here's a tip you won't get from the pros. Want to take extra stuff off of my working bench so I don't bounce it off the edge. So to start this, I'm gonna find this knife wall. And I'm going to come in. Yeah, I'm find this knife wall. I'm going to give it a gentle tap. Because the bevel of the chisel will want to push this direction. So we don't go very hard on the first one because we don't want to bust out past our line that we marked. And I'm going to move it forward. Your bevel keeps moving. The direction the bevel of the chisel goes in the direction you're moving it. I'm away from that wall so I can take a little bit a uh, couple harder strokes here. Very gently lever that up, and we just keep going like that, getting progressively deeper until we get close to the other side. Make sure you're going off of that reference wall on the side there. Make sure that your chisel is square in the hole, otherwise, it won't be wide enough. lever. It's okay to lever against what's going to be waste over here. As I get closer to this side, I've still got a little bit of waste before I get to my marking gauge line. So I can lever there, but at about sixteenth of an inch or so, I can switch to the uh, I can switch directions. Come up, make sure my chisel is perpendicular. I'm going to go right in that mark because, in this instance, the waste is so thin it'll just chip out. I've been coming along this way, and as I get down to where there's almost nothing left, I don't want to be levering against it. So, I'm going to change my bevel to go the other direction, and there's a slope down in here. I'm going to go a little bit steeper than that slope and start working away at that waste in there. Now the bottom of this is stepped, getting deeper and deeper this direction. So to get rid of the extra waste over here, we're going to turn, work this way, with the bevel this way, except this time we make the bevel perpendicular and angle the rest of the blade. This will cause it to cut straight down. If 
forgot to mention my overall depth on this, but a uh, good tip is to mark that depth on your chisel. Get right up to this edge, we will reverse to our original orientation and take out that last little sliver that we kind of skipped over. Bring the camera around and take a look at our finished product.